finally one day she said, all right, you get out here and you just try it. All right, all right, I will. And I did, and I loved it, and I just haven't stopped since then. Welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 143, and thanks for tuning in. Today we get to hear from Mrs. April Pettengill. At Whistlekick, we make the world's best sparring gear, and here on Martial Arts Radio, we bring you the web's best podcast on their traditional martial arts twice a week. Welcome. My name's Jeremy Lesniak, and I'm the host of the show and the founder of Whistlekick Sparring Gear and Apparel. Thank you to the returning listeners, and welcome to those of you checking us out. I hope you like what you hear. Are you right now listening to this show while wearing the world's most comfortable sweatpants? If you're not wearing a pair of our Cloud9 pants, your legs are missing out. Seriously. Check out the different colors we offer, sizes for adults and kids, over at whistlekick.com. If you want the show notes, you can find those at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. You know that newsletter I'm always talking about? Well, I keep talking about it because there are still some of you that are not on the list. We send out exclusive content, and it's the only place to find out about upcoming guests for the show. As a thank you for joining, we'll send you our top 10 tips for martial artists, which is this great exclusive podcast episode that will never be aired. You can sign up for the website, and you can start getting some coupon codes and some other great stuff. We're not going to spam you. One, two times a month. Around the holiday season, we might send you one a week. Really, that's about it. Mrs. April Pettengill is not our typical guest. While she's a passionate martial artist, like everyone that comes on the show, she's not a lifelong practitioner. In her own words, she came to Taekwondo later in life after being somewhat resistant to participating. As time passed, she realized that she'd found her calling, eventually taking over her instructor's school. She now teaches adults and children and seems to enjoy every single minute. Make sure you stick around to the very end of this episode because we have a bonus story that popped up with Mrs. Pettengill after the regular recording. Mrs. Pettengill, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Thank you, Jeremy, for having me. Hey, it's a, it's a pleasure to have you. I'm looking forward to getting to know you better. I mean, we've we've circled around each other for quite a few years now, and <laughs> somehow, despite that, had very little time together. So, I'm going to know a whole bunch more about who you are, and in the process, the listeners are going to know more about who you are, and that's the fun of it. But. We start the same way every time. Some people say it's boring. I think it's necessary. How did you get started in the martial arts? Well, um, I think my journey is probably a little different than most people's journey. Um, and I know everybody's is individual. Um, I had a very late start in martial arts. I took some judo when I was in college, and that was kind of my introduction to um, the martial arts as a training person. Um, I had watched it for years and was absolutely fascinated by it, but never really, um, jumped into it. Um, and I needed a gym credit at, uh, UVM. So I said, there was a, a gentleman there who was a ROTC instructor and he was teaching judo. And I said, Oh, what the heck? I'll, I'll try it. And I, and I enjoyed it. And, um, I did that for, a couple of years with him and then he was reassigned and the program uh, stopped and I didn't pursue it. So then fast forward to my life <laughs> and um, I had a couple of children and my youngest son um, is a very active young man and uh, his pediatrician had recommended that we look at martial arts training as a way to kind of help him channel some of his energy and some of his motion of his body. And so I did some research and at the time he was three and just about to turn four. And there were a lot of programs where like, eh, no, we don't start him till he's five. Or maybe if he's in a mature four, we might bring him in. And just nobody really was kind of interested in, in getting him going. And so I finally made contact with, um, Belinda Hathaway and she said, sure, bring him over. We'll try him out and see what we can work with. And, and I, my older son at the time was 
is kind of a the opposite. He was very shy and um, kind of needed a little more help with getting out of his shell and being more social. And so she took him on and they started training and I sat in the back of the class and I watched and every day she said, why don't you come on the floor? Nah, 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 I'm too old. I was um, 39 at the time. And uh, come on, you can do it. You can do it. No, no, no. I'm, I'm too old, Master Hathaway. I'm too old. <laughs> and uh, finally one day she said, all right, you get out here and you just try it. All right. All right. I will. And I did. And I loved it. And I just haven't stopped since then. So I really didn't start training until I was almost 40 years old. That is a little bit different than most of our guests. That is certainly a little later than what most of our guests have said. But, you know, we, I think you have a school. I had a school. I visited schools. I train in a school now. And I've seen plenty of people that have started later in life, and it's what they needed. It's, it, yeah. you know, and clearly you've stuck with it. So what was it about, Mar what is it about martial arts that, really pulled you in because if you went from that much reluctance to now a school owner, something happened in there and I want to know what it is. <laughs> oh, well, um, I'm kind of a people person. And so I, I enjoyed kind of the social aspect of being with adults and, um, you know, not having any responsibility. I mean, my background outside of martial arts is I'm a nurse and, so I was, I've, I'm always, you know, kind of have to be the one who has to take charge and, um, you know, keep people going, make sure they're getting the right treatment, la la la. And so this was kind of a way for me to release some of that tension and that energy and to get some exercise and to be social with adults without having to be like, okay, well, you need to go home and take your pills and, you know, follow the instruction from the doctor and blah, blah, blah. So and it helped me also to be um, able to work outside of my comfort zone. I'm I never was very athletic individual. I mean, I had dabbled a little bit. You know, I'd done um, dance when I was a, a, a young child, and I was like, you know, the elephant in the um, tutu kind of thing and <laughs> just really totally not graceful. Um, and then, uh, you know, and then high school, I tried gymnastics and I really wanted to be good at it. And I just wasn't good at it. <laughs> my, uh, my gymnastics instructor put me on vault because I was strong and I could, you know, get over the horse and do the hand springs and that kind of stuff. But other than that, uh, you know, I was, give me a beam, forget it. I was always falling off. <laughs> Um, so I wanted to be athletic and I just really didn't kind of didn't have that in me. I didn't think so. Um, this was a way for me to have some exercise and feel like I was accomplishing things, stretching my mind, you know, outside of, you know, my nursing learning. And, um, it, it really helped me a lot, I think. It's great. And that's a great introduction to who you are and kind of what makes you tick. And we're going to hear a lot more about that as we move forward. Now, through your time in life and in martial arts, you've had the opportunity to collect stories. And, and listeners to this show know that I'm a big fan of stories, and that was really the impetus for starting this show. So I'd like you to take a moment now and think about your best martial arts story and tell us about it. Okay, so um, I think probably my my best martial arts story was um, the first time I was in a competition, and um, I, I really, again, this is really stepping outside of my comfort zone, and um, it took me a lot. I'd watched competitions for a long time, and um, I wanted to be out there, but I just quite, didn't quite have what I thought you know, I needed to do to, to do a good job. And so I finally decided to enter into my first competition. I was a blue belt at the time and, and I was 
probably 41, maybe 42 years old. And, um, and it was a local competition. Um, at the time, the USSA was a pretty active organization. And um, we decided that we were going to go to this tournament. And so Master Hathaway talked me into being a competitor, you know, being competitor and said, all right, I'll, I'll try it. I'll, you know, really stretch here and I'll do it. So I get there and, um, as you know, the tournament, um, attendees for, uh, women in higher ranks, you know, other than black belts is pretty sparse. Yeah. And, <laughs> and so I get there and I'm, you know, looking around and there's three competitors in my belt level and I'm looking at the other two and they're, you know, maybe just into their twenties. Um, one of them is well over six feet tall <laughs> and here I am. If you haven't met me, I'm, you know, five, five on a good day. And, um, they were red belts and I was a blue belt and I'm thinking, Oh man, this is just going to be, this is going to be a disaster. <laughs> But I agree to it. I'm going to do it. So um, we get into the competition. Of course, there's three people. And so in sparring, they do with this buy system. And, you know, again, not having a lot of sports background, you probably understand that a lot better than I uh, I do. But so my ally said, well, I'll let the other person have the buy. And um, so I'll end up doing essentially two rounds of sparring. And... Um, so I went out to the first, the first round and I went up against the woman who was six foot tall and the first kick, bam, right to the head. Damn, what am I doing out here? <laughs> so it, it, USSA is a little different from some of the other competitions that we see around here in that it was continuous point sparring and it wasn't a stop point. So I had to keep going, you know, a couple of kicks and I said, all right, you know what? I got to block my head here or I'm going to get into trouble. So, you know, we went along and I got some points in and I'm, you know, doing really well. And they had the electronic scoring and every once in a while I'd see the numbers flash out of the corner of my eye. And uh, so they called time and I look at the score and I'm like, oh, I didn't win. But, oh my God, I just missed it by one point. I, she beat me by just one point and I was so excited and I was like, oh, okay, I can do this. This isn't so bad, <laughs> but I ended up, you know, um, coming out of that with, um, a lot more respect for, um, understanding that I really could do okay against younger, bigger, faster, um, people than I was. So that was again, kind of one of those turning points, um, where I said, all right, I can do this. I may not be the best, but I can do this. So that was fun. And, um, so that was kind of, I, that was kind of the story that came to my mind when I was thinking of my best martial arts story. Yeah. <laughs> and it, it sounds like, you know, now we, we've heard about you in, in your introduction and, and also in your story, you know, a little bit of, of self-examination of your age. You know, so clearly that's something that you're, you consider. Um, and it's something that I think a lot of people consider as they start to age as martial artists or as people who come into the martial arts, you know, later than life, we'll say, because in the martial arts, later in life tends to be anything over what, 10? Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> and I, I think your story is wonderful in, in the fact that you don't have to be nine to do martial arts. You don't have to be 20 to be the best competitor. And I think if you go to any competition, you're going to see somebody that's older that'll still knock your socks off. Maybe they're doing forms, kata, patterns, whatever you call it, and it'll be a figurative knocking of socks. Sometimes they're sparring and it's literal. I've seen, right. I've seen some older folks, you know, people in their 40s and 50s that didn't have anyone in their sparring division get in with folks in their twenties and thirties and take them to town. Right. Right. Just so, yeah, there's some athleticism that's involved, but just as you mentioned, and yeah, I grew up with the same thing. I was not traditionally athletic, 
but within the martial arts sphere, I could do some stuff. I could get some stuff done. And you experienced the same thing. Yes. Yeah, definitely. So the, the, um, the other part of that particular story was, well, I didn't win the sparring match. I actually ended up with the gold medal for the um, patterns. So that was my win out of that one. <laughs> so you came away knowing that this was something you could do. Absolutely. And I think that that's one of the, the valuable aspects to competition. We don't talk about competition on the show a whole lot. Most of the guests that we've had have not been high-level competitors for long periods of time. We've had, we've had a few. But there's something in competition that forces us, most of us out of our comfort zone and makes us realize this isn't as bad as I thought. So... Right, definitely. Yeah. Okay. I no, I would definitely agree. I you know the the thing is when you train with people you see the same people all the time and you get to know their fighting style. You get to know, oh well, you know, their turning kick's going to be followed by a back fist or you know, it's going to be a vertical kick, you know, knife hand strike, whatever whatever that particular person likes to do. And so you learn to adapt to what they're doing, but you don't really end up learning new stuff. And when you go to a competition, you see new people, new ways of approaching things. Um, how, how are they thinking? What are they doing? Where are they looking? You know, what, what techniques are they hitting me with? Why is it successful? Is, is it because I'm not guarding or is it because they're finding the way to get that technique through that's where I think you grow. And while I, I personally haven't done a lot of competitions, I see it in my students um, a lot. Those that go to the competitions and that, um, you know, even locally where, you know, it's not a, a, a high level competition, you still see different people. You see different training styles. You see different, um, fighting techniques and they learn a lot from that. And I learn a lot from that as an instructor, because then I know, okay, well, I've got to teach these people how to defend against that God awful hammer fist <laughs> to the head. <laughs> sure. yeah. So, you know, yeah. that's, that's what I feel anyways. No, you're right. I'm right there with you. So other than martial arts, what do you like to do? Do you have any hobbies or other things you're passionate about in life? Yeah, well, my newest thing is um, I'm a beekeeper. So that's that's been kind of interesting. That's an answer we haven't had before. Tell us about that. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I started a couple of years ago. Um, I got my first beehive and I was absolutely fascinated and scared at the same time because I was like, Oh my God, bees, if I get stung. Oh. Um, but I, I kind of, you know, had a friend who was like, you should take it up. It's great. You know, you're going to help the environment. We need bees. We need people who can take care of them and raise them. And, and, um, so I thought I was doing a pretty good job and my first high just died <laughs> and I was like devastated. I'm like, Oh my God, I'm the worst failure in the world. And he's like, Oh no, 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 no. That happens all the time. Don't worry about it. So then I said, all right. So then I got two nukes, which are basically, you know, the beginning of the hives. And so they, they, um, they did okay. They survived the winter. And then uh, actually this is the third year. And, um, one of my hives just died for no reason at all. And so it's interesting to watch um, how the hives work and how they make the honey and, you know, what happens when you try to harvest the honey and you, you see this um, network and their communication and how they um, just turn pollen and water into this glorious substance. <laughs> So, but I did find out that I have, um, a, a, 
an allergy to uh, honeybee stings, and so now I have my <laughs> EpiPen with me. But I'll I'll continue to do it, to do it. So it'll be fun. Now, how do we draw a connection between <laughs> martial arts and beekeeping? Usually, I can do this. Usually, it's actually obvious enough that I don't have to verbalize it. I'm. I'll put that on you. Oh, how, okay. What? Because I'm not a beekeeper. I've actually thought about it. I, I think bees are fascinating, and and not even because I want the honey, but for the reason you said, trying to help the population, the bees. And I'm a gardener, so there would mm -hmm. be some benefit there. Right. How has your martial arts experience tied into your beekeeping experience? Well, it's very interesting because when you work with a hive, um, you have to be very zen-like. And that's the only way I can really um, express it to you. You just have to, your emotions have to be fluid. You have to be very calm. Um, you need to approach the hive from the right direction. If you stand in front of the opening and they're zipping out, they're going to hit you. They're going to sting you. But if you work from the side or from the back and you can still do what you need to do to keep the hive running and healthy, but you're not disturbing their process. Okay. I like it. <laughs> And I also like to do, you know, hiking, biking, kayaking, anything outside, you know, that kind of stuff. But the, the beekeeper was, is kind of the new thing. And so I'm still really, pretty excited about that. <laughs> that's awesome. That's awesome. We all go through tough times. I mean, that's, that's something I think that's kind of universal and, and something that when we're willing to admit it and open up ties us together. But I find that martial artists have a unique skill set with which to handle those challenges. Tell us about something difficult in your life and how your time as a martial artist helped you work through it. Yeah, um, I've been thinking a lot about this one. And, um, you know, the, the challenge for me is that I, I tend not to really kind of dwell on the bad things that happen, um, kind of learn from it and move on. You know, yeah, you think about it and it comes up now and again, but um, I would say one of the toughest things that, um, that has come up, you know, fairly recently was um, part of my job. I work as a, a, an expert in the legal arena and um, I was, uh, being deposed and, uh, you know, so you're under oath and you have to tell the truth. And of course the attorneys are always trying to tri trip you up and get you to say things. And so I had to be really honest about this particular situation that really was not favorable for the person who had hired me. And, um, I just had to be very careful about, what I said and um, how I said it, and and I was really afraid that that this was going to be kind of the thing that gets spread like wildfire throughout the potential referral sources or referrals, and and um, in the end, it it ended up okay. I had a conversation with the the person who had hired me. And I said, you know, I, I felt really bad about, you know, having to, and he goes, Oh gosh, no, that's, you know, that's the way it is. And, you know, if you had tried to say anything different than, you know, then you're essentially lying. And so the whole idea that you learn in martial arts, that you have integrity and, you, you know, you do what you have to do and take the responsibility for that, um, you know, that, that's a big deal. You know, when I was younger, I would always try to skirt around and try to find a way to blame somebody else or, you know, I think we all kind of human nature tends to make us want to try to find the scapegoat. Um, 
but I think my martial arts training really has allowed me to embrace those tenets and to understand that, yeah, there's ramifications and you just deal with it and, you know, you move on. Yeah. Yeah. And that's certainly not, you know, the circumstance you're talking about is certainly not one that I think anybody wants to be in where you're conflicted between loyalty to someone who has hired you and your integrity. So I, I don't envy that, but I'm I'm glad that it worked out that, that um, you ended up taking the right path there. That's, oof. Yeah. <laughs> it's tough. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I think a lot of us have kind of been in those spots where we're feeling loyalty towards two people or two ideals and how to reconcile the two. And, and I don't know that there's any way to approach it other than to do what feels right in the moment. What do you think? No, I think you're right. I think in the end you have to be, um, you have to be loyal to yourself and I'm not, not selfish, but just understand that you need to be able to look yourself in the mirror the next day and the day after that and be able to say, you know what, I did the right thing. And were there consequences? Yes, because every every action has a consequence. So is it the one that you can live with? So we've heard a little bit about your original instructor, and, and for almost everyone, their original instructor is the most influential person on their upbringing. We know what that's like. We've all been there. But I'd like you to think about somebody else that you've been around, trained with, however the relationship went, that was really influential on your martial arts upbringing, career, however you want to look at it. Wow. Um, so I... Again, this is one that I kind of thought about and, you know, who do I say? And and I have had um, the opportunity to work with a couple of other instructors, um, you know, not on a long term basis, um, seminars or people who've been associated with um, the schools that I've trained at over the years. And um you know, I've I've worked with uh, Laura Williams um, out of Randolph, well, Williamstown area. Um, and, uh, you know, I've done a couple of seminars with um, S.J. Kim. And, you know, that's interesting to get that whole kind of, um, you know, firsthand um, experience. But, um, you know, the the people that I think are the most influential on, um, my martial arts training are, are my students. And, and I say that because I have learned so much from the people who walk through my door and they're, you know, I have to adapt my teaching style for, you know, the kids with ADHD or the, the woman who, um, doesn't want to hit anybody because she doesn't want to hurt you or, you know, the guy who's got the ego and the chip on his shoulder. And you just, you have to learn to adapt. And that has made me realize that, that, um, I have to learn different things. I have to be able to explain how to do things in many different ways. And that's forced me to look at, um, at, at my teaching style and learn to be, um, different and figure out how to teach somebody. And I'm also, I am not really, I would say I'm not an egomaniac or narcissistic in any way. And, and if I have someone who can perform a technique a whole lot better than I can, I'll let them demonstrate it. <laughs> here, you watch this person do it because I can't do it. <laughs> and so I think my students understand that, hey, you know what? I can't do everything, so I don't expect you to do everything. So that's that's what I think, that they've been the most influential in my martial arts training. Yeah. 
It's, and I think anybody that's had a school can relate to that. You know, I'm fortunate that I, I did for a couple years enough that I can understand absolutely what you're talking about. And I think it shows a tremendous amount of humility in any martial artist to be able to admit that someone within their, their school can do something that well. And I'm fortunate enough that my instructor now has that perspective. Um, you know, you know, my instructor, we're, we're not going to talk much about him because I'm still trying to get him on the show. It hasn't, oh. I have asked him it's, it's coming. It's, he will relent at some point. I, I will wear him down. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, there, there's something, there's something really great in that. Uh, and it reminds me, and we've actually, I think this, this quote has come up. I won't dwell on, on the person that that's talked about it, but there, there was a man once in, in competition who I looked up to very, very much and his senior student. Um, I remember I was there the day the first, that he first beat the instructor in competition and the instructor was just amazing. I mean, just a phenomenal forums competitor. And I asked him, how, how does that feel? And he was so genuinely happy that he had fostered that kind of growth. You know, and I, I hear you talking about the same thing and, and you're not articulating it the same way, but it, I can hear the joy in your voice <laughs> as you're imagining your students getting better than you at something. And I, I just, I think that's awesome. I think that's the attitude we should all be bringing in. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> now, if you could train with somebody that you haven't, anybody, they can be anywhere in the world, they could even be dead. <laughs> who, who would you want to work out with? Wow. Um, well, I'll have to preface it by saying I will be scared to death to train with any of them, but, um, <laughs> uh, you know, I would, I would love to train with, you know, like, um, the Lopez's, I think they're, you know, phenomenal, um, a group that um, has done really well in competition and, you know, um, some of the original, I'm sorry, uh, just for people that may not be as, as, oh might not recognize that name. Uh, it's kind of the first family of Olympic Taekwondo. Yes. In, Amer yeah. in America. Um, I, I think the dad is still a coach. Yes. And they've still got what two of the kids competing. I mean, it just, I think it's two. Yeah. I yeah. think Steve has kind of, um, kind of backed out of the competition a little bit, but I think he's still instructing, um, you know, and, uh, and I would love to have trained with uh, in with General Che when he was alive. Um, you know, someone like um, you know Chuck Norris or somebody like that that's got a lot of different variety of background. Something like that would be that'd be great. Now, when you think of people that you would want to train with, what is it about those folks that you would be looking for? You know, why would you pick those people and not other people, say? Um, well, I think that there's, I mean, you see that they're, they've had some success in their martial arts journey. And, you know, they have um, trained really hard and they, they seem to have um, kind of advanced martial arts um, in a way that, you know, maybe the, the everyday person hasn't and just think, wow, what do they, what do they know? I want to pick their brain. I mean, how do they, how do they do this kind of thing or that kind of thing? And so I think that would be, um, and, and frankly, the, I don't know a lot of the different people out there. So my kind of, um, knowledge of instructors in martial arts or those that are kind of in the forefront of, you know, the media attention and things like that. So. Let's talk about martial arts movies and, and media in general. That was a wonderful segue. I'm going to call attention to it because it was just so good and not planned. <laughs> wow. 
Let's talk about martial arts movies. Are you are you a fan? Do you watch kung fu flicks? Uh, yes. Okay. I love martial arts movies. Um, but it, you know, of course, running a school, you don't get a lot of time to watch them. Um, but of course, you know the Enter the Dragon, um, Crouching Tiger, Ip Man, um, anything by Jet Li. <laughs> That, you know, those are all fantastic movies. And I just enjoy a really good fight scene. <laughs> Don't we all? As long as I'm not in it, right? Right. <laughs> Is Jet Li your favorite? He's one of them. Um, Donnie Yen. You know, he's a he's a phenomenal practitioner. Um, you know, I don't think Chuck Norris gets as much um, attention recently as as he used to you know he's a he's a good all-around kind of martial artist in my opinion um I would agree. michelle yo mm. you know um and and recently um ming na wen i don't know if you're familiar with her i'm not she um right now she's in the um Marvel's Agents of Shield uh, oh, series. I, I know who you're talking about. Yes. And uh, but she has done some other work before this and just kind of one of those background people but still a really good fighter. Mm -hmm. Um you know, the thing about about her and about, you know, Chuck Norris is they kind of brought martial arts into you know, the family living room, you know, with like Walker, Texas Ranger, you know, you saw him every, every week, he had a little fight scene or somehow he brought in his martial arts and that kind of brought it to the masses, so to speak. Yeah. It wasn't billed as a martial arts show. Right. But it still exposed a lot of people to martial arts. And, you know, certainly, and, and I'm sure you see this as, as a school owner that, media can have a tremendous impact on the interest in martial arts. Yes. You know, yes. We, you know, we, we've talked on the show and, and more so than probably anything else in the world, enter the dragon, which you mm -hmm. mentioned kind of launched a lot of martial arts schools or at least propped them up. Yes, I think so. So I, I'm, I'm always excited when a new martial arts movie comes out, whether I get to see it in the theater or at home, but um, there's always a piece of me because I am friends with so many school owners, you know, I can, I can see the numbers for them. Oh, if that one does well, they'll, they'll get a few new students out of it. Right? <laughs> of course, Karate Kid, you know, that was always a, a good one. And yeah. that's, so. Yeah, you can almost break up, um, when you started martial arts to what movies culturally led you into it, you know, were you an enter the dragon? Were you an original karate kid? Were you teenage mutant Ninja turtles? Were you crouching tiger, hidden dragon? Right. So. Yeah. You know, yeah. I like to go back and watch the old ones, you know, um, before the whole wire, um, wire scenes were mm -hmm. because they're, they're a little different. You know, now you see a lot of the flying through the air kind of stuff, and which is awesome to see. You still have to have, you know, good technique and form for that, but it's a little different. When I when I think of wires, you know, certainly I think of Crouching Tiger and the, the amazing stuff there that I really enjoy. But yeah. then kind of a counter to that, I think of Tony Jaa, who does mm -hmm. phenomenal things without wires. Yes. You know, stuff that you look at and say, I don't, really? There's There's no... There's no apparatus there. How how did he do that? He's and that incredible. right, and that just goes just goes to show you what their their background is and how phenomenal of a martial artist that they are. That they can still do those tricks and not be you know wired. Yeah, yeah. I, Jean, I, go ahead. No, no. no I was going to say Jean Claude Van Damme. I mean, his fight scenes are are um interesting but it, he's so athletic and so flexible you go my god how does he do that <laughs> and i think that's what made him so popular for the time was that nobody else was doing anything like that and i think he kind of ushered in the more athletic acrobatic stuff now we keep pushing those boundaries 
but personally, I still have to see some, you know, a real kick or a real punch at the end of it. Yes. To enjoy it. Yeah. How about books? Are you, are you a reader? Yeah. Um, let's see. So one of my, um, recent books that I've been reading is called, um, from creation to unification. It's, um, by Stuart Anslow. Uh, and that goes through the history of each of the forms, um, in the, uh, ITF, um, Taekwondo form, whatever you call them. Um, so each one is each one is named after a particular person or an ideal that was very important to the Korean people. And while we get a little bit of that in the encyclopedia and in the training manuals, this book goes into depth about who each person was and their impact on on Korea. And so it's been quite interesting to read that. Mm. You know, as someone who has trained in, in different martial arts, one of the things that I find most interesting about Taekwondo is how much is written and is still being written about it, how much depth we can get. You know, I, I grew up in a couple of different styles of karate. And even though karate, as I was training it, is not that much older than Taekwondo, there was just very, very little about it. So I, I think having that kind of context is, is fascinating. And I hope that non-Taekwondo practitioners will consider books like that, like the one that you've mentioned. Yeah. Because yeah. even if you're not a Taekwondo practitioner, it still gives you context because it's reaching back to that era of formation when, you know, the cultural similarities weren't that different, you know, Japanese occupation of Korea and everything. Right. And, you know, karate coming out of Okinawa, Japan, where, wherever you're <laughs> tracing your lineage. Um, there's a lot of ties there. There absolutely is. Yeah. And then kind of for a, you know, a non, non-martial arts book, the, um, the talent code and the little book of talent, um, you know, it kind of speaks to what, what we've kind of danced around, um, you know, in talking today, it's like some people just have, a real natural ability to do whatever it is that they're pursuing. And some people really have to work hard at it. And that's kind of what the book talks about is, is that whole who's got the talent and who works hard to get there. Absolutely. Yeah. I just did an interview with someone yesterday and, and um, senior grandmaster Rick Alamany, this episode will come out before yours does. So I, okay. can, I can reference it. Oh, nice. And, one of the things that he said that, that hit me like a, like a kick in the face was why not practice? You're, you're going to get better. If you practice, if you practice effectively, I mean, he didn't throw that word in, but obviously you can practice things poorly and get worse. But if you're going to practice and practice well, you're guaranteed to get better. The rate might change, but that's something that we have as martial artists that is – a certainty. If we work harder at something, we're going to get better at it. Right. Right. And my inst yeah, go ahead. No, no, please. Um, I was going to say my instructor used to say perfect, perfect practice makes perfect. Yeah. So if you practice kind of, you know, limp wristed techniques, that's what you're going to end up with. Yes. Yeah. I, I remember when my original instructor changed it. She, it, I was probably seven or eight or something, and, and I remember when she started changing it. She threw in that that the first perfect, yeah. <laughs> that supplemental perfect. And it really, it really clicked for me. So, yeah, right on. You're still training. You're still teaching. You're still passionate about martial arts. What is it that's keeping you going? Are there goals? Are there things you're working towards in the future that? You know, you're driving it. Boy, goals are always tough ones, aren't they? Um, well, I, I think the reason I keep the school going is, you know, to get, to get the martial arts out there to, to people and 
to offer um, an opportunity for for people who don't necessarily um, excel at you know soccer or football or some of the other team sports. Um, you know, this is a way for people to train, have a, a sport that they can call their own. And yet at the same time, you know, you, you are work as a team, you do partner drills, that kind of stuff. So I think my goal is to keep it going as long as I can. Um, you know, obviously bring more students into the school and keep the students that are there. <laughs> right on. Great goals. Right. And it's, it's, it's all about growing the arts. It's all about growing ourselves as artists. Definitely. So now it's kind of your commercial time. What do you have going on? If somebody wants to reach out to you, if they want to stop by and train, you know, maybe tell people where you are. I mean, all that, all that good stuff. Okay. So, um, let's see. We're located in Milton, Vermont. Um, right where Domino's used to be where <laughs> they moved. So I can't say that anymore, but you were making um, too much noise. That's a, <laughs> Good. The, the building was shaking. <laughs> Good. That's how it should be. <laughs> um, and let's see, I, I start kids as early as four, um, uh, right on up. I have, you know, kids classes, family classes, adult classes. So, you know, whatever kind of works for you. Um, let's see what else we've been kind of kicking around literally <laughs> a, uh, an idea of doing, um, either a kickathon or a breakathon for, um, the local food shelf. And we're in the throes of, of, um, organizing that we haven't come out with a date or anything, but I'll let you know as soon as we do. Um, please do. And, um, just as, as an aside to people, um, good time to mention it. If that happens, you know, we, we do put that stuff out over social media. You can check out information for anything like that. Cause we always, we keep the show notes pages updated for each of our guests episodes. So as things get added, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com, you can find Mrs. Pettengill's episode and find out what's going on with the kickathon when, and if it, I'll say when, cause it's okay. Happen. When, when it, it happens <laughs> and after it happened. Excellent. Thank you. So I, I apologize for cutting you off. Keep going. Oh, no, 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 that's okay. Uh, let's see what else. Um, one of the things that oh, maybe this goes back in the goal section, um, but one of the things that one of my instructors um, has been quite interested in, and um, I've been corresponding with a gentleman in um, New Zealand. His name is Ben Evans. Um, he has put together a special needs Taekwondo um, program there, and he's started to take it international, and he did some competitions in London um, for the, couple of, the last couple of years, and it seems to be really be growing. And so one of my instructors is quite interested in starting um, a program specifically for um, people with special needs. Um, and, you know, this would be kind of people who have um, Down syndrome or physical limitations or, um, you know, maybe something that requires some modification in traditional training. Um, so that's kind of on our horizon as well. Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. You, uh, you may want to check out. We had him on the show. I forget the episode. I'll, I'll link it to the show notes. But. Uh, Master Scott Lombardo is yes. doing a similar thing with military veterans in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. And he actually just put some stuff up on social media the other day on a hand sequence that they were using to replace a kicking sequence in their forms. Oh, neat. For, I will for have those that. Yeah. Yeah. So similar stuff. And I think he's developing all this himself. So if, if you want to, if you want to touch base with him, I'm, I'm happy to make that intro. He might even be listening right now and, has already reached out to you. <laughs> that would be great. So, yes. He's a good guy. He's a good guy. So let's see what else. Uh, I think that's, um, oh yeah, I probably should mention, I do have a website. Um, you know, it's Arrowhead Martial Arts and Fitness. Um, 
And anybody is welcome to come and train with me. I have the class schedule up on the on the web page, also Facebook page, of course. Um, so anytime you want to come and train, doors are open. You know, you you joined us for one of our seminars. I did. <laughs> I did. We we had another past guest of the show come up and do some some Olympic style sparring drills with. With you, which is cool because that's not an experience that that I've had before. I haven't really spent right. much time with that, Master, uh, Master Gordon White. So, yeah, shout out to him, good guy. Yeah. I recently had um, one of my um, students who has come to me from um, uh, another school, actually from Hawaii, and they uh, are a military based family, and he is in charge of teaching ground fighting skills to the um, National Reserve folks here in Vermont. And so he provided us with a six-week seminar on ground fighting skills, which was really a lot of fun. Uh, unfortunately, I wasn't able to participate because I had um, injured my knee. Oh. Oh, welcome to old age body here. <laughs> Um, the kick was beautiful. The landing was not. <laughs> <laughs> I think we've all had that experience before. But um, we had uh, had a nice group of people for that. And so we'll probably offer that again, um, you know, maybe in the springtime. So. Awesome. Yeah. I, I couldn't I couldn't make it. I wanted to. Grappling is, is on my priority list. I've been working on it a bit it's in some places. So. Yeah. I hope you do. And, and if you do, let me know when we'll. We'll put that over, over social media too. You know, that's, I know we've got a lot of past guests that listen to the show and, and that's just a, a reminder to all of you and really anybody listening. If there's some good general purpose news stuff or, or a program that's going that has some broad appeal, let us know. You know, we'll put it out. We put a lot out over social media, so we're always looking for good stuff, right? But, well, as we wind down here, let's, let's leave everybody with some gold. What advice do you have for the people listening? <laughs> oh, I would say um, you're never too old to start training and just stick with it. You may not be, you know, the best martial artist around, but if you can stick with it, you will succeed. I've had a chance to work with some of Mrs. Pettengill's students and they're all wonderful people. If you've been around martial arts long enough, you learn that you can tell a lot about an instructor from their students. It's clear that she cares very deeply about each of them and about passing on what she's learned. Thank you, Mrs. Bettengill, for your time on the show today. Over at WhistlekickMartialArtsRadio.com, you can find the show notes, including links and titles of everything we discussed. There's also a place to sign up for the newsletter. You can follow us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, YouTube, and Instagram. The username is Whistlekick. If you want to know what's going on behind the scenes of the show, check out our Facebook group, Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, Behind the Scenes. We're always open to new guests for the show, so if you want to throw your hat in the ring, or maybe your instructor, or someone else that you know, head over to the website, WhistlekickMartialArtsRadio.com, and fill out the contact form. We're also open to any feedback that you might have, or, you know, just giving us a shout saying that you love the show. If you like the show, be sure that you are subscribing, and we're going to stop harping on reviews quite so much. We'd love to have them, but we really feel that if you guys are going to leave a review, you're going to leave a review. So we'd rather bug you to do other things. <laughs> if you like what we're doing, just do something that helps us out. Buy something, tell somebody about the show, really just help us grow this community. Remember the products you can find at whistlekick.com. Every one of them shipping free every day, like our really comfy sweatpants. And don't forget the wholesale program. Until next time, train hard, smile, have a great day, and now stay tuned for a special bonus story from Mrs. Pattengill. So I had been uh, training with um, Master Belinda Hathaway for um, a number of years, and um, I had actually just um, gotten my black belt, so I was a first on, and... Um, she decided that she 
was going to be moving. So the options were, hey, I'm going to close the school down or somebody is going to need to take it over. And um, at the time, there were only a couple of um, black belts that were still training with her. And so of those, I probably um, was one of the more experienced ones. And so I went home and I talked to my husband about it. And I said, well, what do you think? And he's like, I don't know. Um, so after a lot of hemming and hawing and soul searching and um, deciding really, could I do this? Um, I decided I would take over the business. Um, and that was a major decision for me because I already had another business that I was running that, you know, um, and that was pretty much full time. And then to add this on top of it, you know, it was going to be a pretty major commitment. Um, and so my instructor said to me, hey, you know what? You you got to think about this. You've got a family. You've got a business. You know, you're going to burn yourself out if you're not careful. And I said, oh, I'll be careful. I'll be careful. I'll, you know, I, I'll do this because I don't want the students to leave. So um, the first few classes that I taught by myself, I had been kind of co-teaching with her on you know, the after school program for a couple of years and I had done, you know, filled in here and there for classes. But after I took over the school and I was transitioning to being the owner, um, I noticed that people were kind of like not as engaged as um, they had been. And I thought, oh gosh, they don't like me something's going on, you know, this is, this is not working out. Maybe this was a big mistake. And, um, so I decided to do a little experiment with them. And, uh, I, one day at class, I, I brought in a stack of paper and all the crayons and magic markers and colored pencils I could find in the house. And, and I spread them all over the floor and gave them each a piece of paper. And they all looked at me like I had two heads. <laughs> And I said, draw a tree. And they looked at me and they were, I'm like, yeah, just draw a tree. Well, do you want landscaping? I said, just draw a tree. Just draw a tree. I'm going to give you 15 minutes. That's your piece of paper. Do what you need to do. And so I let them draw the tree and I just sat there and just let them do it. And at the end of the 15 minutes, I said, okay, hand me your papers. So I, I felt like, like, you know, the school teacher, <laughs> I'm going to correct them all. <laughs> but instead I posted them all on the wall and I just had them look at them. And I said, are they all trees? Yes, they're all trees. Are they all the same? No, they were not. Some people had drawn hard you know, hardwood trees. Some people had drawn pine trees. Some people had drawn Christmas trees and some had drawn full landscapes. And, you know, it was just a whole variety of things. And I said, you know, they're all still trees. And they're all, it's all the same. It's just a little different. Each one's a little different. And so my teaching style is going to be different, but you're going to learn the same stuff. You're still going to get a tree. And I think that helped with the transition a little bit. Maybe it wasn't the best thing to do, but it was the only thing I could think of to help people to understand that it's going to be different. Just stick with it and we'll, we'll all work through it together. And um, did I lose students? Absolutely. I lost students. Those who couldn't um, make that transition work for them. And I understand that. Um, but the ones who stuck with me are still with me. 